Hi everyone, my name is John and I want to welcome you back to another live Marketing Experiments web clinic. I'm standing in for Flint today. I think he had Golden Corral or something last night. Um, actually, uh, he was supposed to be here, but I think there are some travel delays. So um, regardless, we've got the whole team here ready to uh, present some content, look at some case studies, and uh, get some of your feedback and do some live optimization. Today, we're going to talk about accordion-style checkouts, how one company uncovered 26% more conversions by putting its checkout process to the test. And for those of you who are maybe new to our format, I uh, just want to let you know that we are on Twitter, hashtag WebClinic. If you have any questions or any comments, or you just want to join the conversation, uh, we encourage you to use that. Also, our Q&A function on the GoToWebinar, I can actually see both. So if you have any questions or you want me to see something, I can interact directly with you through that functionality. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with me, I've uh, been with uh, Marketing Experiments for six and a half some years, and I've had my hands chock full uh, into the testing, and I'm excited to have an opportunity here today to share some of these findings. So without further ado, let's actually get right into the research. So there's no surprise, when you take a look here, uh, a study from our mar one of our Marketing Sherpa benchmark guides, shopping carts are a top priority. I mean, why not? All your customers have to go through there. There's an intent to purchase. We've explored the importance of that. But what's more important, especially for today, is this. Shopping cart optimization appears to be rated as one of the most difficult tactics, or, or difficult places, actually, to test, typically due to implementation costs or constraints. And we all know this to be true. To imagine living a single day without your checkout live, or even two hours or three hours. Um, it's kind of like the companies that you know um, don't buy enough bandwidth on Black Friday and they get shut down and they're losing sales. You probably can't imagine that. You probably have to wake up at four in the morning just to get it something like that back online. So changing the checkout process is no easy or uh, simple or uh, just uh, tasks that you want to go about, you know, casually. So oftentimes what I've noticed, and this is something that's come up a lot, um, in the, especially in the last couple years, specifically on uh, accordion style checkouts, people seek the technology. They want to um, look for something that they can implement that, that seems like it will really help the user experience. I honestly just want to know, does it really work? Is it really help? I mean, it's cool, but does it help? So that's what we're going to explore today. So today's focus, um, we're going to talk about the accordion style. Now, if you take a look here, for those of you who aren't entirely familiar about the accordion style, I've got Apple's uh, site up here. Mostly, they use it. They use the accordion style. And when you click continue, it'll contract one process and expand another. So as you can see, it's going to give you a summary, a lot of them do, and then it's going to take you to the next step. So as you complete the shipping process, then it'll take you to payment and so on and so forth. So what I want to talk about today is this. How does the accordion style checkout perform as an optimization tactic? And we're going to be actually looking at an experiment series. Typically you'll see an experiment here or there, but this is actually a series of three. So I want you to stay tuned as we kind of go through each experiment and learn uh, about checkouts, starting with the first. Experiment number one. This is a national news publication selling subscriptions. They want to increase their subscription rate. Who doesn't if they're in that business, especially with the declining industry? So we're working within the checkout process. Which treatment is going to generate the highest subscription rate? Let's take a look at the control. Here's checkout A, three pages. All the necessary steps are stacked, linear style, and multiple clicks. Let's look at checkout B. Here, we have an accordion style. All the necessary steps, just like in step one, are integrated into the style. And the only additional thing um, that really was added, I guess technically you could say there's two, are those credibility and satisfaction indicators, the trustee, and I think the button color. So audience, I want to get your feedback. Which one uh, performed better? Let me take a look. Uh, I've got B from John. Okay, anybody else? I'm standing by looking. Okay, I've got version B, Victoria. A from Bella. 
B, Allison, Scott, B, B, A, okay, Graham. Oh, we've got a lot of Bs. Dave, Margaret, Peter, Heather, oops, sorry. Um, uh, I think Peter said A. So we've got a lot of Bs. Um, it's looking about 70-30. So let's have a look at the results. 29% less. 29% less than what version A was getting. And that's a statistical significance level of 1%. So that's a 99% confidence level. Yeah, that's crazy, right? So by changing the presentation of required information input, 29% less. Well, I had a suspicion. I decided uh, that we would do a meta-analysis of the entire <laughs> library where we've, per where we've tested the um, accordion checkout. And I've selected a couple experiments to show you. So uh, here, another subs uh, subscription group, uh, The Times, from this to this to the accordion, no difference with statistical significance. Well, what about e-commerce, traditional? Okay, um, here's a great example. We've got an e-commerce company selling product. Uh, here's a checkout process. They went to an accordion. What was the result? No difference. What about another example? We've got the accordion checkout here of a, I think it's a, a foundation um, looking to get donations. Uh, they had a long kind of two-step process and right into this nice, easy accordion checkout. What was, the what was the result? No difference with statistical significance. So that leaves me with a question. Why didn't the accordion style checkout, why didn't it, why didn't it pay for itself? Audience, what do you think? Any, any ideas, audience? Tell me why you think it didn't work out. Do you have any thoughts? Anna is uh, at, okay, Rob says looks longer, okay? How long did they test for? That's a good question. These were all tested for, um, for history effect, for reasonable amounts of time, two to three weeks, enough data to conclude with statistical significance. Motivation is high, so in most cases, customer purchase regardless, says Allison. Open to the wrong page, says Philip. Browser issues, says Dave. Well, these are the kind of questions that we, come, we have when we sit down and we see a result like this. Um, our team of analysts honestly believed that by going into the accordion style, we would significantly reduce friction. But we were beginning to wonder if it really did that. So we decided to conduct a second experiment. Same group, same checkout flow. Okay, here's checkout page A. And and again, this was uh, all the standard elements of the checkout process. Now let's take a look at a different set of changes. We've kind of been through this before, too, in previous clinics. We decided to do something radically different comparatively. So instead of going into an entire accordion style, they decided first, well, let's change the copy and the image at the top, and let's reemphasize maybe some of the value that they had already seen. And uh, since they're this far into the process. And well, there's a lot of lines in between some of, you know, there's boxes and right. And uh, we don't really reemphasize the savings. And it's really kind of hard maybe to engage. So let's make those changes, OK? And then, well, the call to action is pretty straightforward. But why don't we realign it to the left, color it, um, and more importantly, rename it to emphasize that final step, right? I mean, continue to, I think, review my order. And then finally, well, let's bring back, back those credibility indicators, um, even though it's possible that they didn't really contribute or they, they might not contribute, but let's bring them back. So audience, how do you think the team did? Version A or version B? We've got B from Philip. B, B, everybody saying, oh, we've got one who says A, ha ha, B. Well, you're like, John, why in the world did you ask that? Okay, well, you guessed right. We saw a 24% relative increase in conversion from small changes. And I want to ask you, why? Why do you believe that those small changes made a difference for the results? I'm looking at the screen. Rob says less friction, okay? What else? What else? Better flow, says John. Clarity of value prop, reinforced value, uh, reduced anxiety, less friction, nada, okay? Victor, less clicking, or less clicking. Emphasized info important to customers, color focus, says Paul. So we've got a lot of different thoughts as to why this made a significant difference. 
which also means we probably should make sure that what we discovered is right with a third experiment. Well, let's take a closer look. If you take a look at the copy and image changes, if you think about what they're actually doing, they're helping somebody remember the value so they could weigh it directly against the immediate cost. That's one thing that it could potentially do to somebody going through the process. By removing those boxes, we believe that we're minimizing the mental stops here because sometimes just having a line there almost kind of slows me down in a sense. Again, it's hypothesis, correct? The call to action, well, instead of continue, it's written to reflect a step that's really important to visitors. Uh, try to have checkout without a review page. I'm sure it's, it may be possible, but in some cases it may not be. Uh, a lot of people may have anxiety about that. That's what we hypothesized, so that's the change that we made. So what we've got here in terms of difference is this. Yeah, and the call to action says, review my order. Uh, that's for you, uh, Gabriel. So it makes me wonder, what's the big common denominator in this treatment compared to the accordion checkout? Well, when you think about it, the small changes had probably a potentially greater impact, perhaps, on the mind of the visitor, right? It, it, it reminds me of a um, actual report uh, from, I think, the British Insights uh, team in for the British government. They uh, were trying to get more uh, people to pay taxes, right? More delinquent people to pay up on their taxes. And instead of sending the typical delinquent letters over a three-month period, they sent a letter stating a social norm. Nine out of 10 people pay their taxes. And well, they probably are the 10th person. <laughs> What they saw was a 30 million uh, pound increase annually in tax revenue over a simple change. And this kind of reminds me of that, right? So uh, and I've seen similar experiments here too that kind of remind me of that type of change. So here we've got a checkout. Um, you've probably seen this before uh, from past clinics where we've got a number of different kind of headers, a very long page, that's why it's split up there into two parts, to this, same long page, same steps, same amount of information, subtle changes, no lines, a couple extra testimonials, 12% increase in revenue. And this other uh, experiment here, where we've got a shopping cart that very much reminds me of um, my baby's toy area, just stuff everywhere, but with some subtle changes, here you probably might not be able to notice them, but if you're reading into them, you could see there's uh, testimonials, credibility indicators, right? even a place to get your questions answered, 11.6% increase in revenue, which was huge for this group. Which then leads me back to the original experience. So that original page that we had seemed really long. Would you guys agree? What would happen if we shortened it or found a way to shorten it? Could we shorten it in the mind? Well, let's take a look. Same group, same goal, same, te same test setup. And then now the performing checkout that's winning above the others. We've got page one and page two, same form factor. And now we have a different treatment. The only difference between this checkout and the other checkout is that every step is divided into its own page. Plus, there's an indicator graphic on the top there, if you uh, can see. And I think there's some shading for, the, for like the, the radio button areas. So let's take a look at them side by side. Audience, let's vote. Who thinks version A, who thinks version B? I see a lot of Bs. I see a lot of Bs. Matt, Victor, okay. I've seen A's, a lot of A's. Anna, Steven, okay, great. B from Joe, okay. Well, steps work well, B, says Paul, okay. Version B, progress trackers helps users, says Chandra. I hope I got that right. Um, Jeff, not sure. <laughs> I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad you're being honest. So, well, let's find out, right? We're, that's what we're here to test for. No difference with statistical significance. Take a look at the statistical confidence level, 54%. Now, Here's the thing, you could go into that additional steps, but it's gonna cost you to do that. 
It's going to cost you to make those changes. We can't just make changes. We have to go through a design team. We have to go through a development team. We have to make sure that it's going to QA and work. Again, imagine your checkout um, being down for an hour a day because we didn't implement it right. So here, splitting the cart into additional steps wouldn't guarantee a return. Okay. And then a, a great, uh, we've got a, a question actually from Heather. I know Paul's uh, working on it now to get the exact one. But we actually um, have a test protocol tool. Um, Paul, could you send her uh, maybe a copy of that that calculates statistical significance? I think using, um, we had a whole clinic on it last week, uh, the t-test and, and other different um, you know, calculators. But it's, it's really great. Um, I think there's a, f a link that we could send you guys. But ultimately here, no difference, which brings me to kind of a conclusion of key learnings. This is the last clinic, Paul. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm answering uh, Paul Gerard's question there. So here's some key learnings. What we learned is that the goal shouldn't be to, say, impress the customer or to improve necessarily the UX or the user experience. It should be to enable the customer. And uh, the way I think of it is, is this. Um, if I want to make a difference for my wife, right? Um, I can't, you know, and I want to, you know, help her with cleaning, right? Um, I could uh, try and impress her with a real, like a Dyson or some kind of really expensive cleaning product. Um, or I could just buy her a cleaning service. <laughs> and according to her, a cleaning service would be much better. It would get the job done and she would get more done. Which leads me to the next point. Just because you put a new engine in a car doesn't mean that it's going to perform better when it comes to interacting with visitors and customers on your website. It may work for a car. It may work for um, you know, buying extra storage for your iPhone. It might even work for putting RAM into your computer. But it doesn't necessarily work that way with customers. Just because you spend a lot doesn't mean you're going to get a lot back, um, which forces us to really question what our investment should be into the cart technology. It shouldn't necessarily be only to get a game, but it should be to get us a platform that really enables us to change what's actually happening in the mind of the customer. Again, it's, it's not just simply let's buy this and implement it because we think it'll work or because it worked for Apple, but rather let's actually look at the technology in terms of its potential to help us do more in terms of relating to the customer. It's very much like the templates clinic we did a couple months ago. Sometimes having the right template will allow you to have a better conversation, which will enable you to really reach a part of their mind that you weren't able to in another template, even if at first there's no difference. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to go into a little bit of live optimization. We've actually got a lot of time here um, I think we've got a total of, what, 20, um, 15, minutes. 15 minutes. So we'll be able to cover a lot. But first, I have to, <laughs> I have to let you know we, we actually have a fall publication sale. Um, I'm not sure how they get the code. But um, if you guys are looking for research, especially to help kind of fuel an idea that you have for something that you're doing or to kind of understand what you should be testing next, these benchmark guides are great for that. I use them all the time for those types of things especially for developing hypotheses and refining them. So it's there for you guys if you'd like. No There's no code? Oh, okay. Then you should be able to get to it. Uh, with that, let's go into our first page. Here we've got uh, Go Goodens Optical. I hope I said it right. <laughs> so um, I, I can't really see the bottom left part of the page there, but um, uh, I think uh, we could see the rest of it pretty well. So audience, I'd like to get your help. How would you help this company optimize their checkout page and their, or their cart page here, um, kind of from what you know and from what we've learned. Trust indicators is weak. Uh, okay, call to, okay, call to action is weak. Remove left nav. We've got value props, says Brett. Um, checkout should be on the right side, Igor. Okay, clean up on the page. And that button should be huge, okay, orange. Uh, what else? Too much text at the top. That map at the top looks virusy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, everybody, thank you. Um, so let me try and help you.
based on some of the findings and patterns that we've been seeing in the research. When you take a look at this page, there's one thing that, there are a couple of things, there's one thing that really kind of stops me, and not necessarily in a good way. Um, let's take a closer look at that additional checkout information section. It's right under the PayPal, um, and it reads, uh, we strongly advise getting a kind of a, a shipping confirmation of an air and uh, for residences that have potential security issues, and then it offers you two options. So if you're in an apartment um, and you weren't planning on spending that money, then you might as well just shell out because it's going to get stolen. That, that's, what, that's how I feel um, when I see that. Now, I would, I would love to understand the difference in behavior if you were to do a couple of things with that. One, what if you put that in the next step of the process where they actually fill out the shipping? That's the first thing because now I'm competing against checkout versus buy now and I'm not sure it's going to actually be, like I'm not sure it's actually going to apply. And the second thing that I would love to understand the effect of is rewording that to say um, something not it's going to happen to you, but in the event that it does, you're prepared. So it doesn't make them feel like they can't buy it at all. It's tricky, right? It's tricky, but it's the kind of change that could produce a significant difference potentially. Um, you know, another thing too is shipping. Every, I, I've had a hypothesis about how many customers enter checkout never intending to actually check out because they're trying to get a shipping amount. Well, you've got a nice little free shipping both ways on, charge on uh, orders over 99. What if you were to move that into closer proximity of the order summary? Perhaps that could answer that question in the customer's mind about the cost of shipping and help them to work that out or to duplicate that. So those are just a couple of different ideas, a couple of different things that you could do to change what's actually happening in the mind of the customer. And then finally, any kind of testimonials, you may want to test in close proximity to, again, surrounding the area, especially if it's a high purchase, like a, a very expensive purchase and you got expensive glasses too. And, and if it's prescription, then that's even more important for it to be getting on time and to be getting right. Let's go to the next one. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Emdco, okay, um, their safety enforcement department, and they, uh, it looks like they sell signs um, for parking lots, um, labels, tags, and uh, this is B2B. And uh, this is, looks like it's, again, a kind of a cart page. So audience, let me ask you, how would you optimize this page? How would you help uh, this group out? What kind of things could affect the mind of the customer or changes that could affect the mind of the customer? Okay, denotes, don't use red on buttons, says Heather, denotes warning. We got reduced color, too busy, says Victoria. Too much red, okay. Too many colors, way too busy. Put promo code clear to price. Um, reduce visual clutter, definitely too busy, says Gabriel. Okay, too many graphics of equal value, says Mark. Too many favorites, says Paul. Too busy for me, too, says Dave. Not the time to upsell, says Christian. So um, we've got a lot of great uh, commentary there. Uh, this really reminds me of that checkout page we looked at just earlier in this deck. And what you've got is you're surrounding kind of that decision uh, it looks like what, one thing that it appears that you're doing well on the right is you've got the rest assured that you're going to get 100% safe and secure, 60 years of service. So those are things that I would say that you're doing well. Okay. Now, I would wonder, just like with the audience, the effect of changing the customer favorites to something different. Let's just say the text. You, customers also purchased. Now, again, I'm not sure what the patterns of purchasing are for this type of product, but if if it's something where they can just easily add to the cart, something that helps them make the sign more effective, then perhaps framing it in a way that they could understand its benefit or the reason why they should consider adding it may help. Now, there are some that would just opt completely out of trying to upsell them at that time, perhaps later in the cart. Well, if, if you wanted to test that route, perhaps test different content there, like testimonials. Um, it's B2B, so maybe if they have questions, maybe there's an, a service level expectation that's still in question that you can address here to help them go through. Finally, um, the tax is zero, but it says estimate tax. 
estimate shipping and handling. Um, what would be the effect of removing the tax zero to estimate tax and then kind of Xing out? Again, just little things like that that really stop people and make them think could make a difference. And, uh, and there's actually, um, there's a great question here, and who's this from? This is from Victor. Can you have too many trust indicators? Well, <laughs> uh, let's just say this. There, um, what I've discovered, a pattern that I've discovered, is there's typically a threshold. There's typically a threshold of trust that needs to be established. Now, um, I can't reference a particular experiment offhand where it went overboard, but oftentimes there's a threshold where you need to convey that, yes, I'm trustworthy, yes, I'm doing well. But if it begins to look like a, a NASCAR, you know, the side of a NASCAR with all the kinds of stickers, and it begins to get in the way, that's something that might set the customer off. Again, that's a hypothesis. Um, I've seen patterns, but um, that's a great question that we could explore in greater detail with a meta-analysis in another clinic. Very good. Um, are we ready for another one? Let's go to another one. We've got factory outlet store. Yes, we are ready to review that. Okay, this is an online consumer shoppers, B2C product sales. Audience, instead of telling me what you would change, tell me things that would stop you or cause trouble in your mind, okay, that would make it problematic for you to check out, okay? Let's take a look. All the lines, Christian says, that big search box at top, length of process would stop me, says Chaston. And that's interesting comment because it's one page. So, um, but again, it's not about the number of clicks, it's about, it's not about the pages, it's about the mind. What am I buying, Thomas? That's a very good observation. Don't see my ordered items, says Victoria, okay? Breadcrumbs show no summary step. Okay, what else? We've got um, anything else? No confirmation page, picture of product. These are all valid questions. And for some customers, they may produce a level of anxiety that stops them right in their tracks. One of the things that we've discovered is that you can't mitigate anxiety in rational terms. You have to overcorrect. So in this case, I would love to understand the effect of addressing those things. Maybe not necessarily in, you don't have to stack the page, but maybe you could test making those columns a little bit longer to accommodate those different types of things. Another question that I have is, what about my billing address? Now, to be fair, it's right above the checkout button, but I can't see that. And because I can't see it right away, and I'm supposed to be seeing everything, I might have some anxiety about where that is. Another, another issue, um, another thing that seems to stop me is I start in the middle. I start at number two, and then I've got to figure out where I am. The indicator at the top, if it's a two-step process, it doesn't, I mean, it may, I, again, I would test the effectiveness of that. Is it adding unnecessary space? In fact, is the, the search bar or the header adding unnecessary space? Those are all questions that you, that you could answer in a test and discover. And then finally, there is a, a test uh, that I remember in it was actually one clinic that we did in December of last year where we, were, we took a similar process that was laid out side by side by side and stacked it linear, linearly, one on top of the other. I would love to understand the effect of that, and you may have already tested that. But if you haven't, these are the types of things that I think could possibly make a difference in the mind. Finally, credibility indicators. We've got some here. Norton and McAfee next to the total, but typically one of the patterns we've discovered is that credibility indicators effectiveness significantly increases when it's in close proximity to the decision area or to the area where they're wondering if, it's, if they should definitely do it, which would be checkout. Now, to your, to your point, you've got a great uh, lock there to kind of help them kind of perceive that it's secure, but they have to jump across the page. Again, I'd love to understand the effect of that. We've got a question from Chaston. Is it wise to possibly remove the search bar items like links that could possibly bring the customer away from the checkout page? I, um, I've actually run a couple of tests doing this. In, in some instances, especially in transaction type pages, this has significantly helped. It's reduced the number of competing options. However, there are some instances where by removing those links and, and not specific, it's Almost, and I've noticed this more so, um, actually there was a specific instance where 
customers that didn't see that navigation or the surrounding elements didn't believe that that was secure or it was right or something. It, I remember that test very specifically. Um, so you really have to discover it. For a lot of cases, I do see it help, but it, not in every single case. So it's something that I would test. All right, would you guys like to do another one? Let's do another one. Rosetta Stone, um, you've probably seen the commercials and maybe even tried it. They're here they've got their checkout page, users interested in learning a new language. Um, this is a product sales, B2C, probably in some cases B2B for you know, large groups. Let's just assume B2C in this case. Audience, let's have a look. Tell me what you would do differently. Tell me what you would do differently to this page. We've got an ad percent discount. Okay, so what does the customer value more? Is it the actual amount or is it the percentage? It's a good question. Okay, we've, hey, we've got some, one person says it's quite good. Put confidence indicators near the bottom, says Nathan. Remove FAQ. The subtotal 499 seems confusing in relation to the line item listing. Okay, that's from Matt. And I actually have an observation about that, Matt. So I'll get to that in just a moment. And a product info needs to be bigger, more emphasized than confidence indicators. Add a target audience photo, says Rick. Okay, testimonials, says Brett. Showcase that you can pay in installments, says John. Okay, very good. So uh, I think we've got a lot of great feedback on this. There's one question that I would have for Rosetta Stone, and only you would know the answer to this. Does the majority amount of your customers buy more than one language at a time? Because if they don't, why are we sending them into an open cart when you could send them into a closed cart? There was a particular test that we ran and showcased a, a number of clinics ago where we actually removed this step and took them directly into checkout because it made sense for them based off of their purchasing patterns for this particular product. You might potentially be able to remove this entire step. And that's one of the benefits. I've actually, um, another colleague, um, former research partner who Again, worked with a group who had a single product. He went from an open and, um, and a couple of upsell products. He went from, a, I think, a closed checkout to an open checkout and saw a significant decrease. Went back to a closed checkout and went to increase. And then they saw a, a greater increase when they actually upselled after the fact. So Rosetta, I don't know what your metrics are and I don't know the purchasing patterns, but if you could figure out the answer to that question, I bet you might have a test that could produce at least a, a statistically significant increase, possibly. Um, to the audience's point, um, the reason why they're probably experiencing confusion with the 499 and the 299 is because there aren't any other products there. That's why it's there, it's to subtotal it. Um, and the confidence indicators, to the audience's point again, I think that there's some, they've, they've got something that they're saying. Why not move those in closer proximity to the area where the decision is made? Very good. So those are just a couple of the things that I would recommend you test and discover and see if it makes a difference for your visitors. Let's do one last one. We've got one minute left. Audience, help us out. Align a shot. Golfers, B2C product sales. This looks like it's a kind of a cart summary page. Let me hear from you. What would you do differently? Peter Thompson says picture. Dave, no value prop. Rick, no emotion. Um, David, show shipping. Brett, secure payment. Um, we've got upsell from Victoria, okay? Darker green um, from Christian. Add more info on what they'll be getting from Catherine. Move 100% next to checkout. Okay, 100% next to checkout, all right, very good. All right, so with the, just the moment that we have left, same comment from the last time. You, looks like you do have just one product here. I, again, I haven't been to the site, so I can't be sure. Here, a close checkout might actually produce a difference in behavior for your customers based on the perceived length, okay? Um, all these other comments that the, that the audience is making, I agree with in terms of the proximity issue. Also, it looks like you've got some sort of a registration down there, but it's probably part of the standard footer. You might wanna test suspending that so there isn't confusion um, in some sense. And uh, let's see, I think there's another button that says update. So if you wanna buy more than one quantity, again, why would you want more than one training mat? Um, these are the kind of questions you have to think like the audience. I think that might actually help you in discovering the kind of changes that can make a difference. 
Uh, I think we're out of time, uh, Paul. Do we have any more? I think we're out of time. So thank you, everybody, for your time. We got through five pages today in live optimization. We'd love to hear from your feedback. Um, but um, thanks again, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next clinic. And Dr. Flint, he, he really <laughs> is going to be here, I, I promise. Thanks, everyone. Mm-hmm.